In this episode, I award Kareha the badge of reverse identity. Santa arrives in a sleigh and gives gifts. Kareha arrives in a sleigh and takes things. Welcome to the journey. Welcome to the crew. We think we're pretty funny. And we hope that you will too. This is the opening song to season two. It's where the journey really starts because we've made it out of East Blue. We've got our snacks and we've got our friends. Now it's time to discuss the anime that never ends. Yeah! Start the show! Alright, hello fellow adventurers of the Grand Line and welcome to King of the What Now, a podcast where we discuss the anime One Piece. I'm Kat, and I'm a witch who lives in a mysterious castle on the top of a mountain. Bam. You look rather good for your age. What are you talking about? I'm a young 130. And I'm Joel, a longtime fan of the series. I am a snow bunny, a giant, overly muscular snow bunny, and I've got mad hops. I'm Curtis, king of this podcast. I've returned to take control. After you ran away like a coward! Also, it's episode 33. Hmm? Huh? Oh. Sorry, it's also episode 33, and Curtis just challenged me to say it to his face. So now I'm making eye contact with him as I say, you're a coward. I thought you were going to say, I'm making eye eye contact with him while I say, it's episode 33. It's episode 33, (laughs) and you're a coward. Joel, which episodes of the anime did we cover today? Uh, We covered the first four episodes of the Drum Island arc. Those are episodes 78, 79, 80, and 81. The first one is Nami is sick, beyond the snow that falls on the ocean. And the last one was Ya Happy, the doctor who is called a witch. I'd just like to say there was not nearly enough percussion in this episode. Ah, yes. Because it's Drum Island? Yes. Okay, so the very first thing that we always do is we try to remember what the heck happened in these last four episodes. I'm going to be honest... I'm going to not remember most of the first three episodes because there was so much exposition and such. And also, we saw something really freaky at the end of that fourth episode. But we will get into that in a second. This is going to be a shorter one. Because, yeah. Summary. Nami was sick. New pirates show up. They are led by... Wapple. Wapple. That's it. I wanted to say Warple. Uh, Wapple. And... Wapple starts eating the ship because he's eating the uh, munch munch fruit, which apparently means he can eat anything. He tries to eat Luffy. Luffy shoots him off the ship. The pirates leave to go collect their captain. Launches him off the ship with, like, a punch. To be clear, Luffy did not wield a gun in this episode. Oh, yes. Um, Then they find an island. It's called uh, uh, Drum Island. Mm -hmm. We just said that. And... They go there to try to find a doctor for Nami. Uh, after some convincing, the people on the island let them come ashore and bring Nami. And they go with another character we meet whose name is Dalton, who is an ex-member of the military of the island. Um, and they find out there is a there's only one doctor on this island, and she is a witch that lives in a castle on top of the mountain. Um, so Luffy and Sanji take Nami and they're going to go climb up the mountain. In the process, they have to fight snow. They have to fight killer bunnies. They have to fight giant bunnies that are trying to drop an avalanche on top of them. We find out that Warpole is the former king of this island. He was really bad at it. And when they got attacked by a group of pirates led by a pirate named Blackbeard, dun, 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 they, uh... He fled along with his entire army, leaving the island helpless, except that Dalton stayed there, um, and he's kind of like a leader of the island now. The de facto leader. I think they mentioned something about an election, so I think they've switched the democratic process. Yes. Uh, But at the end of the episode, Wapple comes back to the island. He's been trying to get back forever to get get his kingdom back. Um, He gets there, and Dalton finds out that Wapple is back. And so he leaves. He's going to face Wapple. And as he's going, he 
turns into a bison and leaps off of his horse and continues running. Yeah, and that's it, where the episode ends. Yeah, it's quite strange. There's no explanation for his power. No one calls him a monster, so maybe this is his secret curse. No one was around to witness him transforming, and I believe Usopp, someone mentioned that it was almost a full moon in one of the earlier episodes as they were getting near the island. Mm. And so, I mean, Curtis, what are your thoughts as someone who is just starting the series? He is clearly a werebison. He was bitten by another werebison in the past. Either that, or he was bitten by a radioactive bison, or he was bitten by a radioactive werebison. Okay. You don't think that a radioactive wear bison would result in something strange, like him turning into a bison with green fur or something? Well, I mean, I'm colorblind. I don't know what color his fur was. <laughs> That's Fair not enough. how colorblindness works. You tell us all the time you know what colors are. I know what some, I know what some colors are. It was okay. my toe. Okay. I don't, uh, yeah. You know what some colors are, just not all the colors. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, Catherine, why don't you tell us what part of these episodes that you thought was most interesting? I really love Kareha a mm-hmm. lot. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, who is Kareha? I didn't give her a name. She's the spooky witch lady. <laughs> my sister in arms. Um, she just kind of shows up and does whatever she wants, but like you can tell she has a heart of gold down under there. Also, she's talking to her reindeer, Mm -hmm. who seems to understand what she's saying and, like, can bring her antibiotics from her bag and stuff. So that's interesting. He's got a nice hat. He does have a nice... It's weird, though. It's weird that he's a reindeer wearing a hat. Mm -hmm. It's a little too fancy for a deer. (laughs) So obviously, Dr. Kareha, despite being 139, is into what is hip and funky fresh and is... Posting pictures of her reindeer on Instagram. That's oh, how she gets such a following. She would, though. Like, all of all of the One Piece characters we've met so far, Kareha would definitely have an Instagram, and she would definitely be inappropriate with mm. it. She'd be, yep. like, Instagramming a funeral. Wow. Possibly. She, she does, like you said, she has... You can tell that she's a kind person based off the way that she deals with the one child we see who is sick in the village. But she also has this sort of attitude where she's kind of sharp-tongued with people, where she goes, Hey, you shut up, and I'm going to take half of your stuff, and why can't you be nice to me after saving your son's life? But she does have a bit of a kind heart underneath that kind of tough exterior. The first thing that I think whenever I see her, if I'm ever re-watching the Drum Island arc, is... She kind of reminds me of sort of a rock star, and I don't know what it is about her attire or her personality or whatever that makes me think that, but she's pretty spry for a Mm -hmm. woman who's up there in age. And there's also a scene where she runs into Zoro, and Zoro calls her an old lady a couple of times, and she decks him and sends him flying. So she's obviously not a frail old lady. I I would say that I'm suspicious of her youth. Okay. I mean, she's a witch, but typically witches steal youth from people to mm. stay young. So, and oh god. I was just gonna say we already know that her payment scheme for being a doctor is to take whatever she wants from people's houses. Okay. I think she's sapping youth from life people. energy. Yeah. Oh man, that would be cool. What I think it is. So this island was known for having the best doctors in the country. I think she's such a good doctor that she's doing medicine on herself and keeping herself Ooh, alive. That's that's possible. Uh, that is, oh, sorry. Also, potentially the only other creatures we've met with really long lifespans are the giants, so maybe her dad was a giant. But she's very small for somebody with giant heritage, so probably not. She got her height from her mother. <laughs> we also have not so far seen anything to indicate that it is possible to mix the genes of one race with another. Mm. Arlong were the only fishmen that we ever saw, and they were all fishmen, no humans among them except for Nami, who's a special case. All of the humans we've seen are just humans, and then all of the giants we've seen, all two of them, have just been pure giants. So maybe it's possible for interbreeding, and maybe it would work like that. Maybe you could have a human and a giant, and the child would be just human or pure giant. I don't know. So this is a Star Trek scenario where random races that developed on completely different planets can interbreed <laughs> and produce viable offspring. I'm not saying that. I'm just not saying that we have any proof of that. Okay. Going back to your question, the other part of this episode I liked is that Vivi is supposed to be undercover, but she's really bad at it. Um, Yes. 
Like, she talks about how her father took her to Monarchs meetings and how Wapple looked familiar to her. And it's like, are you even trying? Like, cover your hair in a scarf or something. Be sneaky. Princess Jasmine was really good at being undercover, and she's from a desert kingdom. So I think Vivi and Princess Jasmine are taking different approaches. At the same time, Jasmine went undercover in her own kingdom, whereas Mm. Vivi is out on the sea. I agree that if you have bright blue hair, that might be kind of recognizable, but it just, no one would suspect that this woman with the straw hat pirates is secretly the princess of a kingdom. Except for Dalton, who seems suspicious. Yes. He said something about, like, I'm absolutely certain of it now, which you and I might have foreknowledge on, but as far as these four episodes, we did not get any elaboration on that. Do you guys have four knowledge on this series? We have five knowledge. Oh. That's how advanced our knowledge is. Absolutely. Um, so let's see. Another thing, Catherine kind of mentioned this. It's not just that the it's not just that the doctors were well renowned in this town, but I think like in this entire country it was famous for its doctors until Wapple started messing that up because let me tell you, he is a bad, bad king. Mm-hmm. But it is interesting that they're trying to find a doctor, and they happen to find a country that both meets and fails to meet their expectations. It used to have the best doctors, but now they're all gone. (laughs) I thought that was interesting. Well, if you'd gotten here, like, you know, a year ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think it was like a couple of months or something like that, and... um, So, yeah, can we just take a moment to talk about this Blackbeard thing, because... I don't know much about the actual history of the pirate era um, in in real life when piracy was at its height, but I do know the name Blackbeard. That's the one from Treasure Island, is it not? Um, Or is that Long John Silver's? uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I know he was an actual pirate. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a real Blackbeard, um, and the only thing I remember about him is uh, he would, when he would go into, like, when they would be raiding ships and that, he put... um, like, I think they were, it was like fuses and I don't know if he did firecrackers, but like fuses in that into his, he would braid it into his beard and his hair and light it on fire. So he'd just be, have smoke coming off of his head. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's okay. cool. I know. He was pretty badass. Uh, when the Blackbeard Pirates were mentioned, we saw some silhouettes. Did anything about the silhouettes stand out to either of you? They looked like pirate silhouettes. I... They had pirate hats. Here's, here's the problem. That's kind of a loaded question, because obviously, maybe obviously, Joel and I have seen some of these characters, and so I saw their silhouettes and I was like, that's that guy! And so to me, there are things that stood out, but I guess it makes sense that to you, you'd be like, these are some generic pirate silhouettes, that's cool. Yeah. I do also want to point out that I believe when we were in the Little Garden arc, Luffy and Dory were talking about how you could leave Little Garden without your log post setting, and maybe you'll get where you're trying to go. And they mentioned that there was someone who had been at Little Garden who had left without checking their mm-hmm. um, their compass. For reasons I can't get into, I'm almost positive that that was Blackbeard. The timeline roughly lines up, because... Yeah. It was shortly before Luffy got to Little Garden that this person left, and Walt, uh, sorry, I almost called him Walton. I mixed Wapple and Dalton together, but uh, Wapple was dethroned just a couple of uh, months ago. I say dethroned. He ran like the little yeah. coward that he is. Yeah. I, um, I have a question. Yeah? Do we know, like, what does Blackbeard have to gain from destroying this island? Like, he shows up wrecks some stuff and then leaves. I'm assuming that he probably took some treasure with him, too. Yeah, okay, pirates take treasure. That makes sense. I mean, I I think we are used to following the the Straw Hat Pirates who don't go around and raid towns and take treasure and then leave. Um, But I would assume that's somewhat normal for some of the pirate crews, at least. They are pirates, Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were introduced to one other character in these four episodes that we haven't brought up at all. Uh, Mr. Two set out to kill Mr. Three, and we only oh, yeah. got a very brief glimpse of him and his swan-themed ship. Oh, yeah, because uh, Smoker and uh, Tashiki, Tashiki uh, made an appearance again, uh, mm-hmm. and they captured Mr. Two, who... No. They captured no. Mr. Eleven. You're right, they captured Mr. Eleven. I'm sorry, we're getting two different scenes mixed up. They captured Mr. Eleven... 
But yes, we saw, briefly, we saw Mr. Two talking to people at in Alabasta, I think. I don't, yeah, I think maybe so. I don't want to go into it too much, but I'm excited to talk about Mr. Two more later when we've seen more of what he does. Mm -hmm. I do want to kind of circle back. I think I lost my train of thought a little bit earlier. The interesting thing about Blackbeard, maybe they show up later. Maybe it's just a name drop to make the world feel more full. Maybe Luffy showing up and meeting or and finding the country without a king means that the story will take a different route than if he had shown up and Wapple was still in power, for example. But I think that if you're going to write a story about pirates and you name drop one of the most famous pirates, that just seems really interesting. And I think this is the first time that it's happened. No one else, maybe you could say that Captain Morgan could be a, a reference to the alcohol. I don't know if there's a real Captain Morgan, but... Blackbeard is one of the only names taken from real world history and inserted into the One Piece world. I believe there was a Captain Morgan that the that the Romans named after. Okay. So we now have two, but I'd say that one of them is more tenuous. One of them is literally the same name from the real world, the same title yeah. sort of thing. You know, there was actually a Captain Buggy, too, in real life. Had you uh, never yeah. heard of Captain Buggy? No, I hadn't yeah, somehow. Yeah, he was, you know, every, he was the terror of the Caribbean in, like... <laughs> 1994. He, oh yeah, he, he toured on uh, doing a clown act on cruise ships there, and he he got caught pickpocketing some people and he got mm. kicked off the cruise ships. He was wanted for murder because it was said that someone on the cruise ship had insulted his big red nose, and he had responded with "Whose nose is big and red?" and he'd just gone on a rampage, <laughs> just right then and there. They covered it up and said that everybody on the on the ship got sick, but no, no, the clown went nuts. <laughs> That's actually where our common clown phobia comes from, is from that one incident that's embedded in all of our, our uh, psychic memories. Not psychic memories, no, our yes, collective psych psychs. Yes, psychic. No, psychic memories. Joel. Okay. It, we all absorbed it used through our collective human psychicness. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I do also, you, every once in a while, I'll say, if you're not watching these episodes at home, here's like one scene that you should take time out of your day to watch. My favorite one from these four episodes is Luffy and Sanji going towards this mountain, which, by the way, it's not like a triangular pyramid mountain like you're used to. It's like a round column. It's like a straight up to the very top, and I have no idea how Luffy's going to climb that thing. Anyways, they're running towards this tower, and they're warned about the Lopins. They're dangerous animals, and you see a bunny running or like watching them from behind a tree as they're talking just kind of about whatever and this bunny launches itself like a freaking torpedo right at luffy as he's talking and he just ducks and it goes flying over his head and then he stands back up and he continues talking like nothing had happened and then a second later you see the bunny shoot itself at sanji and sanji kind of twists to the side but again they're acting like they don't even see these bunnies that are firing at them and eventually sanji's like stop interrupting and kicks the bunny into the air and that's when the parents show up and the parents are much bigger than the small uh, baby lapins but a the lapins are cute and b i love the way that luffy and sanji are talking about oh did you hear that people in snowy countries never sleep well did you hear that the women in snowy countries have super smooth skin and it's three or C, I can't remember if I was using numbers or letters, but I love that uh, they're just completely oblivious, but not really to these animals that are attacking. It reminds me of the fight with um, Miss Valentine's Day and oh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Five. Five. Oh, yeah. When they first showed up and Sanji and Luffy, or not Sanji, Zoro and Luffy were super <laughs> focused on each other and then eventually were like, you're annoying! Mm hmm. This is something that One Piece has earned. We've now seen Luffy and the other crew members do awesome things, take out imposing threats. So at this point, they can have a little bit more fun with it. They can have these characters kind of messing around while also being in dangerous situations. At this point, we're so used to them being strong and goofy, we can now get both extremes, and mm. it's, it's a good juxtaposition. Agreed. So that covers my favorite scene. Catherine talked about her favorite scene. Curtis, is there any standout scenes in these particular episodes? Um, I'd say the uh, the scene when Kareha, 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 mm -hmm. the scene when Kareha heals the little boy. Mm -hmm. I think that was a good one because it was a good character introduction. You get a good feel for who she is as a character. Absolutely. Um, 
both, I guess I should elaborate. Uh, so we hear there's a kid crying. And the dad's like, you need to stop crying, stop crying. You're irritating our customers because they run a restaurant. And Kareha is outside the door and it's like, well, that sounds like a bad father. Any kid who's crying, it's probably a sign that there's something wrong with his body. And then, you know, bashes down the door and goes in um, and, you know, figures out what's wrong with the kid and fixes him. Uh even though the, the parent is not, like, cooperative. And then also, her form of anesthesia is she has her reindeer chopper headbutt him, the kid, so he's unconscious. Um, but anyways, she does end up helping the kid in the end. And he lives instead of dying. And then she takes initially 50% of all of the assets of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And then the kid thanks her and says, thank you, I feel so much better. And she's like, that was a good tip. I'm only going to take 49% now. Also, your toilet paper, because I'm out of toilet paper. <laughs> she's so weird, and the reason they call her a witch is because apparently she comes to town on a sleigh, and it's very much so a Santa Claus reference. As soon as we saw it, all of us recognized it, was, it for what it was. It was a picture of a sleigh flying through the air, being pulled by a reindeer mm -hmm. in front of a moon. It While was, it's snowing. Yeah, it was like, you're Santa Claus. Exactly. But she does the reverse. She shows up and she takes people from all the different people. Calling her a witch is interesting because I feel that it's a very witchy or kind of fairy thing to do of instead of paying you, me money, I'm going to, you're going to owe me a favor or I'm going to take something from you that seems like the sort of compensation you get from fairy tales. You know what it is? Okay. She's not St. Nicholas. She's that other guy. Um, oh, sure. The Krampus? Yeah, she's Krampus. <laughs> she comes and she just takes. Also, she's good. She, she takes people and kills them. Oh, geez. Okay, I interesting. that's what Krampus does. <laughs> well, that's what... Yeah, I think that's what Krampus does. I don't know if she's does. what's going to do. I yeah. got the impression from Kareha that she is a woman who appreciates um, strength and, like, straightforwardness in people. And so I kind of feel like she almost sees it as acceptable that she's taking things from these people in exchange for her healing because they're weak. They couldn't even hold on to their own doctors in the first place. Mm. And I mean... Also, supply and demand. There's only one doctor and a lot of sick people. <laughs> and no insurance. Yeah, I know. Mm. I, I liked how early on, uh, so there's a flashback when uh, uh, Waffle Wobble? is king. And he's like, we're going to get rid of, we're going to exile all the doctors except for 20 that are be my personal doctors. They'll be the 20 MDs and they'll just be for me. Um, and, you know, people can pay and use them. And... I was like, oh, so this show is about, like, high medical prices. Here's the thing. Wobble's point that people would have to be nice to him and they wouldn't be able to rise up against him because he controlled all the doctors in the country, that was something of a smart political move. I think eventually you'd have insurrection anyway, but whatever. But, like, it was despicable, but it made sense. He's still a brat, though. Don't like Wobble. I don't think he did it because it was a smart thing to do. I don't think he saw it as a way of putting the people down. I think he literally doesn't care about the other people. Well, that's and true, but he also explicitly said, this way nobody will rise up against me. Fair enough. I think it's interesting that we... We don't talk about the themes of One Piece that often, but one of the themes that does show up is you have to be willing to fight. You have to put your life on the line in order to make dreams happen. That's the super secret uh, formula for Luffy's success. He always fights and he always puts everything on the line and he achieves more than those around him. That's what he inspired Kobe to do. So I think it's interesting that as soon as Wapple saw strong enemy show up, he said, nope, and left the country. I don't... You can tell that he doesn't care about the country itself. He only cares about the title and the status. He's a pompered rich brat, and oh my god, it's gonna be so good when Luffy punches him in the face. Or the mouth, or the stomach, or wherever he's going to get punched. Do you think he'll get punched, Curtis? I do. Okay. By Luffy? Uh, probably. I mean, Zoro's not gonna punch him. He'd cut him and 
Sanji's not gonna punch him. He'd kick him. Yeah. Luffy is the main character of this anime, so I feel like he ends up doing most of the really impressive things. But it seems like if anybody should be allowed to punch him, it should be like Dalton or one of the people mm-hmm. who actually lives there. Yeah. So it would be cool to see one of the characters who has some emotional stakes fight him. But I get it being Luffy, because mm-hmm. Luffy's our man. I'm going to think Dalton will help. Also, I do got to say, it would also be great if Vivi took him out, because of the number of times she's commented on what kind of a king would do this. I would love it if she showed up and, Might makes right, I'm taking this country. Elavas is going to absorb the drum kingdom and kick you out of here, God, Wobble. Imagine that. Imagine a Vivi adventure where they keep getting stuck at these different islands, and she keeps adding them to the Alabasta <laughs> Empire as they go. And by the time she actually gets to Alabasta, she's raised an army to take down the rebels, <laughs> and then and then she takes over, and then slowly turns into a like a despot, mm. ruling with an iron fist over her whole empire. She and gets her she... own metal jaw, and she marries Wapple, and to be continued, oh. chapter two of <laughs> fan fiction. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't gonna marry her off to Wapple. God, <laughs> she can have the weird shapeshifter Dalton. Oh yeah, okay. It took me a second. Shapeshifter. Oh, that's right. He turned into a bison. <laughs> okay. I have two more points that I want to bring up related to Dr. Kureha. They're yes. both very short points. Kureha is 139 years old. Everyone calls her 140, but she likes to correct them as 139. Also, one of the first speaking lines she gets when the villagers talk, they, they yell, It's Dr. Kureha! She goes, What's that? You want to know my secret to looking super young? Even though she does not quite look super young. She doesn't look old and frail, but she is she's not in her 20s anymore. You can tell by her design. But uh, the other thing that's interesting about her in addition to the old age, is her name, Kureha, to me, I know a little bit of Spanish from high school and college, and the Spanish word for which is bruja, and just the fact that her name ends in that sharp ha sound, I almost feel like that's intentional and an allusion to uh, her witch status in the village. So those are just two interesting facts, and... Uh, I don't know if they'll ever say this in canon, but it is not impossible for a human to live to 140. That's the lifespan of a person in the One Piece world, even though in our world it's about 100, you would say. Yeah. So, all right. And with that, I think that we need to go to our sponsor for this week. Yes, that's right. We got a, another sponsor this week. And as usual, it's going to be someone that hasn't sponsored us uh, so far because we like to keep our products new, fresh, and interesting. You know, they've always had that phrase about bottling up your emotions, right? When you're in a situation, you're getting angry or you're sad or that sort of thing. Maybe you just try to ignore it. Maybe you try to push it down and it's, it's called bottling it up. But this company, Magic Bottle Incorporated, has actually found a way to make that phrase a reality. No longer will you have to have the willpower to prevent yourself from exploding and yelling at uh, those you care most about or people in position of authority, perhaps like your boss or a teacher, for example. Now, you can use this patented magic bottle technology and it'll just <laughs> slurp all of your emotions away. Can it be used in conjunction with the slurp matic Yes, that's right. You can combine it with the revolutionary te- technology of the slurp matic so that way it can be even better at absorbing your emotions and that sort of thing. Feeling kind of down? Well, you should probably see a doctor, but it's also possible that you could absorb a little bit of that excess, you know, energy. And maybe if there's someone who's just a little bit too perky, you could just kind of switch it on to the reverse mode and inject them with some of it and kind of, you know, just even them out a little bit more. Are you recommending we give our sadness to other people? No, I'm just saying that in a true utopian society, we should all you know, share our emotions in that way. So everyone should have a little bit of the happiness pie and everyone should have a little bit of the of the sad pie and that sort of thing. Also... So, hmm? Wait, are you suggesting that we redistribute emotions? Yes. Evenly throughout the all of society. That sounds awful. Did the company <laughs> pay you to say this? Yes, of course. It's all here. Steps for world domination. Step one, emotions. Step two, 
animal emotions. And that brings me up to my next point. Have you ever wondered what it would be like if your super sassy cat was just given a little bit more destructive rage? Now you can do that too. <laughs> the magic emotions that you're putting inside of your bottle will be able to take your pet to the next level. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to know if your super happy, go lucky, happy puppy could be even more energetic? Oh yeah, we've got a bottle for that. You can buy our pre-packaged green bottles with energy emotions and the red bottles with the destructive emotions so, so joel i got this i got this bottle here that that says uh um concentrated evil genius okay so i'm not sure it's an give... emotion what else are they mixing is this like the new product this just in magic bottle 2.0 well past oh that's step three on taking over the world perfect so, so if i were to give this to to your destructive cat please yes. what would happen i do you really want to know the answer I mean, I took a little of the evil he genius, kill, and I'd like to know. He could kill all of us. Actually, let me let me be perfectly clear. We do have a cat that some of you may know from the uh, outtakes that we post on uh, Patreon. Consider supporting us on the Patreon. Who is spraying with water currently. Yes. But anyways, this cat is so destructive. If you gave him the evil genius bottle, it would actually make him dumber, because he's already at peak evil cat genius levels. I just want to make that clear. So anyways, buy the uh, the magic bottles. And hey, for every three magic bottles, pre-packaged emotional bottles you buy, you get a fourth one free. And also, for every package that you buy, they will take a little bit of money and put it into their fund to take over the world. Perfect. Support the cause. Build a perfect society. Okay. So now we're back to these main episodes. And, Curtis, I gotta ask you, did these episodes feel like filler to you? Initially, and then not. Okay. Where was the turning point? Uh, so, I so I guess I should be clear. When we got to Warple Island, I was pretty sure that Wapple. was... Wapple. You keep wanting to combine the word Wapple and Nurple. No, because yeah. you're obsessed. <laughs> Nurple is your word of the day. If well, you were on Mr. Pee Wee's Funhouse, that would just make the balloons come down and I actually and all that. meant Drum Island anyway. So, <laughs> when we got to Drum Island, that portion I knew was not filler. It did not feel like filler. They needed to get Nami help. And I, it's, you know, once we got to the island, it's like, okay, this is not filler. Initially, I thought Wapple, who sounds like Waffle, was filler mm. because of such a random short bit. And then we found out he was the old king. And then he showed up at the end. I was like, okay, so none of this was filler then. All of it's relevant. Everything is important, Joel. You should not, for, you should not neglect a single detail. In the One Piece universe. No, That's no, That's why no. it's very important that Zoro's third button is a different color from all the other buttons. Okay, I'm not That's sure not I'm true. following. That's not true. I'm just I'm just giving it exa- Nothing. It's, it's, <laughs> this is a failed bit. We're going to okay. move on. No, that's all right. No, so he has the one button that is vote for Luffy because the Pirate King is decided by democratic process, and that button is white with black text. He has another button that says, damn chef, because he obviously doesn't like uh, Sanji. That is a white button with black text. But his third button, it's in a different color, and what it says is... Uh, down with anarchy, but it's in the wrong color, and that's significant because he's actually wearing that button ironically. He is, mm-hmm. he's very much up for anarchy, and he right. doesn't like people who are trying to suppress the anarchy. Yes, yes, it's in the yellow and black, which, as we all know, are the colors of the anarchist flag, therefore demonstrating his true loyalty to the cause. And Interesting. Then, then he has a fourth button that says, I heart Oda. And that one was just there for Oda. He also has the secret button on the back of his neck that can be pressed every once in a while. That's when he's getting too, like, angry, and it just puts him to sleep. And man, that episode, when Smoker finds out about that button, there's no way that Luffy could possibly get out of that situation without his number one swordsman at his side. Really quick, really quick, Curtis mentioned Oda, and I learned something new about him. When he's bored, he goes on Twitter and he posts videos that I guess he has an app on his phone where he can make little creatures show up 
in like AR. And so he posts videos of little creatures messing around on his sketches for the new One Piece chapters. Huh. Yeah, like I think the last one we saw was dinosaurs, and I've only seen a couple that were different dinosaurs, but I, he, there might be other animals that he That's might. Great. The last one was dinosaurs. The one before that was gingerbread men for some reason. Like, I love Oda so much. He's such a ridiculous man. Joel. Yes. Are there gingerbread men in One Piece? <laughs> Are there? There might be. I don't know. Where would you think it would be thematically appropriate to have gingerbread men? Would it be with the witch, do you think? Or would you have a island that was made out of, like, cookies or baked goods? Would you have a magic spell book? Gumdrop Island. Gumdrop Island, okay. Yes. All, everything is edible. Which is actually a problem because Luffy just eats everything. Okay, including the people. Yep. Tell me about the bad guy for Gumdrop Island. Bad guy for Gumdrop Island... Uh, was uh, Farquaad from from Shrek. <laughs> Boo! Come up with your own material. <laughs> Reference okay. joke. Okay, uh, the bad guy from Gumdrop Island is Dr. Robot. He cannot taste the sugar on his taste buds, so he he, he hates all organic life who are t- who are having this experience that he can in- not enjoy. Yeah. Dr. Ro- Did I say doctor or mister? Doctor. Dr. Robot wants to experience all things that humans do, and that's the one thing that's eluded him. Joel. Sleep, he's experienced that. Um, kissing ladies, he's experienced that. Kissing guys, he's experienced that. His toes running through the grass in a freshly painted field. I don't know why <laughs> I said painted, but he's experienced that too. He can simulate all of those, but not... The ability to taste delicious snacks. Joel, I have a question for you. Yes. Are there robots in One Piece? I don't know. We haven't seen them yet. There are submarines in One Piece. Go on, Kurt. The real villain of Gumdrop Island is Kale Veganman. Oh, okay. (laughs) He does not eat candy or sugar. Mm, It's cool to animals. Vegetables and other. Mm, Luffy's greatest fear. Every night he wakes up and he goes, ah! And Zara goes, are you alright, Captain? And Luffy goes, it was the vegetable dream again. (laughs) Oh my god. Imagine him waking up and Zoro's looming over him and he's suddenly terrified because what does Zoro have? Vegetable hair. Oh no. (gasps) And then he wakes up from that dream even more terrified. Um. Oh, submarines. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, there is a submarine in this episode. Unfortunately, very- it's not yellow, so you can't make another reference joke. But you just did it. Yep. So, well, I mean, it's not yellow, but I, we don't know how many uh, how many leagues below the sea it goes. Oh, okay. Okay, Curtis, so there's submarines in One Piece. Yes. Um, oh, but, but this was just a... Uh, not Wallop. Wapple. Wapple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> This is that was just Wapple ship. Okay. It was a it was like a normal ship, but then like this thing comes up over the mast and that, and then encapsulates it all, and then it can sink in the water. It's like a bubble, sort of made out of steel. Yeah, but... it's kind of it, it was weird. Yeah, so I I need to actually look into the different histories of when things happened in the real world because I know that I think Isaac Newton had the design for a submarine, but I don't think he actually built it. I don't know when the first real submarine was built. They mentioned anesthesia, and I looked that up, and that was like the mid 1800s, which is much earlier than I thought. I thought that was for some reason like a 1900 sort of um, invention. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, just the submarine seems like another thing that is technologically advanced beyond where I would have assumed mm-hmm. One Piece would have that sort of thing. So now we've got we've got the submarine. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got glowing weapons. We've okay. We've got... Uh, we, we've got the, the, the various high-tech alien sightings. Mm, yes, uh, those, those have been happening just nonstop. The radiation that they pumped into mm-hmm. the various crew members as part of some evil plot to take over the moon. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the mushroom clouds in the background on that one island, mm-hmm. that was interesting. And that was weird when, this isn't exactly a techno- technology thing, but it was just weird that one time when we saw Usopp stomping on what were clearly Goombas, like, I did not expect Oda to be such a fan of the Super Mario series as to bring those characters into yeah. this. Like, what's going to happen next? Is Kirby and Wapple going to have a uh, an eating contest or something? I don't know. And then, you know, there was Disco, too. I mean, come on. <laughs> Which clearly is from the 1970s and no earlier in history. Oh, I wasn't going to say anything, but since you're looking at me uh, expectantly, I do have a question for you. 
if you were going to do a One Piece Nintendo crossover, which character would you match up with which franchise? What a fascinating question that would take about an hour to probably discuss. Uh, you know, between all of us, we could have different opinions and we could put that as a bonus episode. Yeah, okay. I mean, probably not Halo. That's my answer. That's not, not a Halo. Nintendo game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were talking about video games for a second. Okay, so definitely not Kid Icarus. I never played it. I have no idea what that's about. There's a guy with wings. Who is VIP? Not VIP. MVP. That's the one. Who, yeah, who would you... I'm going to let you answer first, Curtis. Who would Nami. you... Nami. Nami for being very sick, but still willing to help Vivi out. The Vivi Nami friendship, which spoiler alert is only going to get stronger as they get closer to Alabasta, is on point this episode. You have Nami getting sick and trying to say, "Oh, don't worry about me. We need to get to Alabasta super quick." And then Vivi gives the speech about, "We need to get to Alabasta as quickly as possible." And you go, "Oh no, that means she's comfortable with letting Nami die." And then she says, "Let's get Nami better because she's the only one who can navigate us there." And they, I think they're supposed to be about the same age, and I think it's just the fact that they're both girls, but their friendship is very strong, and there's a lot of uh, scenes between them kind of helping each other out and mm-hmm. building each other up sort of a thing. I thought MVP of this episode was Dalton for mm. explaining all of the background. <laughs> there was so much exposition in these episodes, but it was delivered in a less obnoxious way than exposition is sometimes delivered in this mm, show. Mm-hmm. So I appreciated Dalton. If I had to pick a real MVP, I would probably go with uh, maybe Nami, maybe... I was going to say Zoro, but no, Zoro just kind of hung out doing his own thing. Kareha, actually, was my... My MVP. She's great. She saved that kid's life, which is more than we can say for anyone else in this uh, yeah. show. Which other character has saved a kid's life? Mm-hmm. None of them. And she also punched Zoro. Or no, kicked. And one of she the two. kicked Zoro. She put him in his place. It was beautiful. I thought it was a punch myself, but it we don't have to a get... punch. I'm tired. It was a hit with a limb. Yes. Um, I think that I would have to give MVP... To Vivi, because when so- when they sh- first showed up, we kind of glossed over this a little bit, but who cares? So these people lost their king to pirates uh, and then also got attacked by pirates. So they don't like pirates very much. When the Straw Hats show up, they all pull out their guns and they say, get out of here, you're all pirates. Sanji wanted to attack them. Vivi kind of, like, hugs him, grabs him, holds him back, prevents him from running. And while this is happening, they take a... Excuse me. While this is happening, they take a shot. It only grazes her arm, but at the same time, she basically was trying to de-escalate the situation. And she even agrees not to try to come into the town. She bows her head and actually teaches Luffy for a moment. Luffy kind of looks at her and he goes, huh, okay, yeah, maybe fighting isn't the answer. And he bows his head and she just helped facilitate communications and working together We've kind of seen this so far, but it's only going to get, this theme is only going to get stronger as we go further on. Luffy's very good at punching people, but he can't solve all of the village's problems without the help of the villagers Mm -hmm. wanting to kind of contribute. We got that a little bit with Dorian Broggy having to help them get past the giant goldfish sort of a thing. And so Vivi is MVP for teaching those lessons to Luffy, who let's face it, is an idiot and could use a little bit more schooling on delicate political issues. That's a good point. Diplomacy, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay. Um, So, Curtis, this is a question that I wanted to ask often, but I've kind of forgotten, but this time I'm actually sticking to the script. Do What do you think is going to happen in the next couple of episodes? Obviously, Wapple is here. I think it's safe to say that's the threat. Him being there is kind of a threat. We have an avalanche, and we have Nami being sick. Mm -hmm. Can you see any of those elements playing out in a particular way, or a way you'd like to see them play out? Okay, so, um, as far as the Wapple-Dalton confrontation that is clearly coming, I think Dalton's going to challenge him to a rodeo, Mm. and if, if, if he can lasso him up and hog tie him, then Wapple wins rights to the island again. Mm, okay. I, to be honest, I'm not sure what's going to happen. She's sure. charging at him as a buffalo. I'm, I'm, something will happen. Okay. Um, 
I think Luffy and Sanji are going to get away from the, the avalanche somehow and continue on their trek up the mountain, which is going to be interesting. Um, Kareha. I said that right, right? Yep. Okay. Kareha is, I think, headed back to the mountain now. Um, hopefully. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that they get there with Nami. I think that's going to happen. I, uh... I guess, because Usopp and Vivi were together, they'll probably f- try to follow Dalton. Which okay. will be an interesting, because they're not going to be great backup. I mean, I, it'll probably end up being Usopp trying to protect Vivi. Sure, because she's the important one, and he has to be the brave man to protect her, and that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, okay. And then, meanwhile, this is Zoro's turn to be useless on the sidelines and like oblivious <laughs> to what's going on as he just continues to train in the cold weather. Yeah, I'm not quite... I get it that you sometimes want to focus more on one character or another, but Zoro staying back at the ship and then doing some training and walking around, I gotta be honest, I don't remember where Zoro goes Mm -hmm. next, and it just feels like Oda said, well, I only need two people for this scene, and two people for this scene, Zoro can... He'll be doing push-ups. Yeah, I I think either... My guess, and we'll see if this keeps happening... Uh, is that in order to sideline certain characters? So, like, he might say, okay, well, this plot works, except that if this one character's in there, then it really kind of, mm. you know, it's going to oversimplify things. I'm just going to sideline this character for the plot, right? Yeah, well, and I think Zoro is supposed to be fulfilling the role of watching the ship. Uh, he's just real dumb. He's bad. And he got lost. Uh, Zoro, your name is not Zoro, your name is Curtis. Curtis, Yes. one of the questions Joel liked to ask you a lot early into the podcast was, uh, did anything feel like foreshadowing? That question's a little open-ended, so I'm going to shift it a little bit. Did Zorro going on and on about, like, if only I could have cut through that wax, I need to get stronger, did that seem like foreshadowing to you, and what do you think will be the result of it, if so? Um, I mean, yeah, I think he's going to get stronger. Uh, I clearly he's gonna keep training. Um, being One Piece, his strength increase is probably gonna be like superhuman. <laughs> I mean, and he's pretty he's pretty beyond most humans already as it is, and mm-hmm. his determination and his ability to stand on his feet even when he's bleeding from yeah. hip to sternum or whatever that phrase is. I just I'm thinking like Zelda level like. Shooting lasers out of his sword. Right? That okay, would be so cool. So that's your prediction: is laser swords? To well, be clear. Okay, yeah, I was gonna more like slashing energy waves, but laser swords. Let's just say laser swords in general. Okay, perfect. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Unless anyone has a final thought. Final thought: Are Karu and Zoro going to be the buddy cop duo we needed? <laughs> I would love that. Final thought? Mm-hmm. Laser swords. Aliens. Are there aliens in One Piece, Joel? You have to figure out the robot thing first. You promised me ah. that an escalation from one thing to another. Okay. Um, or no, gingerbread men. We have to wait for gingerbread men to no, show up before we're doing you can... robots. I asked robots last episode, I think. Too, okay. So. We'll Wonderful. robots first. Here is my final thought. Luffy versus Wapple. Both men with big appetites. Maybe this arc won't end in punching. Maybe it'll end in a feast. And they could both be eating spaghetti, and then it turns out that the one strike between them. I think with that, we're or, ready to sign off. Imagine Wapple is eating Luffy's feet. Luffy is eating Wapple's feet. They're just a <laughs> or a Boros of two really hungry people. <laughs> Have a good oh night, goodness. everybody. Outro right. goes here. So ends the next leg of the King of the What Now adventure. We're sad to see you go, but we'll be here next week. If you crave some social interaction with us in the meantime, you can find us on all sorts of different media. We have Gmail, Patreon, and Tumblr. All of those are King of the What Pod. King of the What Pod at gmail.com, patreon.com slash king of the what pod, king of the what pod dot tumblr dot com. Our Twitter handlers are a little bit different. You can reach me at K O T W N underscore pod. And you can contact me, Curtis, at Pirate Co-host. Also, please take a moment to rate and review our podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen. Not only will this help others find the podcast, but your constructive feedback will help us improve the show as we go. Thanks so much for giving us a listen. Until next time, follow your dreams and protect your treasure.
Remember, it doesn't need to be literal treasure.